and getting horses, animals, animals, horses, but not getting that connection that you get when you use the verb to be and you're a fluent speaker of it enough that you realize this set is included in this set. Right? Um, could be because European languages have been influenced by Aristotle and by Greek as they go. So a category we might also call a set, right? A set of things. So I might have um, a mare, which is a female horse, yes? And notice that a mare is not only a female, she, what I just said is a female horse, so she's uh, a horse. Is a larger category and includes ma all mares, right? So I can say all mares are horses. Can't say all horses are mares, right? Uh, then I can also say um, animals. Well, let, let's let's go even a step uh, in between mammals. We could do mammals. Um, I was going to say ruminants, grazing animals. Right? You know, I think that's what you would call a room. You use that word or not? Equines. Equines, I think, would be equivalent to horse. It's just Latin. There's like zebra and there's other equines that are not horses. That's true. That's true. That's true. Good point, Paul. Um, but ruminants uh, would be in a larger set. Not all ruminants. I mean, some other ruminants would be a deer, a moose, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, I um, wouldn't call them equine, though. Bovine. And then we've got, well, animals. Um, they're definitely living things. And those are all things. Imagine that's still another set, right? So notice our language will enable us to say all mares are horses, all mares are ruminants, all mares are animals, all mares are living things, all mares are things. And, but you can't go the other way, right? So what we're doing, thanks to the Categorie, which is one of the books he wrote describing how to do all this, right? is realizing that in our language what we're doing is calling things by a name and saying they're in this set of category or this category right? and the members of this category have characteristics that enable you to place them in other larger categories and discriminate between say cats and dogs which notice neither are included in the other set so both categories are mutually exclusive. So that would, you know, so that's why no cats or dogs, no dogs or cats. It's a universal negative. Right. You might say, I'm not happy. That would be a universal negative. Because the subject is no member of the set, Bill Jamison, is in the set of happy things actually a false statement because I'm actually thrilled to death. I love doing this stuff. I'm happy. Not the same character that's in the Seven Dwarfs. It's a different kind of happy, right? See how these work? It's actually quite simple. And in fact, you've been using it all your life, whether you realize it or not. We do get confused. We do have people that say things like, well, for example, this is a good cup. That seems right, doesn't it? This is a good cup. Now that would be an A statement. For everything that is this cup is a member of good cups. Right? 
but actually that would be wrong. Because it's a terrible cup. <laughs> well, the problem with this statement is it's an opinion. If I'm calling it a good cup, you might think, uh, I hate it. Right? That cup sucks. That cup sucks. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and the trouble is, how can I prove to you? No, this is a good cup. Actually, I just proved to you that this is a rotten cup. You will never live. You can have it. You think, yeah, it's supposed to eat everything in there. No, it doesn't. It flashes all over the place. So, but it depends on what you mean by cup, because I've had this cup for years. It's, it's really in good shape, and it's just metal. And I got it for free, which is also fun. You know, I like free. I'm really free. You know, poor Irish Catholic, you know, free. Oh, I'll have free. <laughs> you know how that goes. Um, this is a good, I, I was in the commissary just the other day, and I saw another big grocery clerk, you know, going through a bag of potatoes, putting one at a time. I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm putting some of the good ones out. I said, well, put them three of the good ones in this bag. Thank you. I took three good ones home. And I made it last night, and it was delicious. My wife and I shared it. It was a big thing. But the trouble when you're talking about good or bad is that's an opinion. And a scientist couldn't prove it, unless you had like a, a, a strict rule. All of the the loaves of bread that are, are good are dated this date. You know, you can check the date. And they're still good. That would be not an opinion so much as a fact. And facts are, are true or false. That's, that's pretty easy. That's how that works. So, Paul. I don't want to confuse it, but like, that's still a, like an ethical standard. It's like you're still applying a, a, some sort of a well, uh, arbitrary if, standard to if, it, uh, make it so that you can call it true or false. Yeah. Food and drug, you know, maybe made it. Um, the, well, probably the brand name, the maker of the bread, uh, decided to date it a certain day. Very confusing when you, you, you know, best used by, and you think, you know, but, you know, so it's best used by four years ago. Is it still good? Uh, you have to go on the internet and look up. Well, if it's this kind, if it's pineapples, it's probably still fine because acidic keeps it from rotting, you know. But you know, there's all kinds of discriminatory kinds of, of issues associated with that. So, so yes, how do we determine whether it's a fact or not? Today, we would argue that it's the sociality of reason. That doesn't mean that there is no truth. It means uh, that. We as a society determine by our vote, basically, the democratic, whether or not it's true or false. Right? Uh, there are things that are much more uh, uh, you know, universal in agreement. Physics, for example, you know, physics is kind of, you know, if it's a law of physics, you can't really argue with it, right? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Rogue. I said right. when you need to try, though. <laughs> yeah, this is a second argument. That's true. Well, when you get into very specific uh, things like viruses um, and vaccination, boy, are we having a field day, field day with that issue, right? Uh, because it's so complex. And in fact, you know, it seems like those who are promoting a particular interpretation of things don't really know the consequences of what's going on. So I could be sympathetic to folks and say, you know, don't give your children this, because you know, we, we don't know yet what it's doing. We won't know probably until we're dead. And by then, it's hard to know things, from what I understand, to, from a perspective today. Well, so, so this is. This is basically the way categorical reasoning works. Um, we go to the internet and we go to the metaphysics. Um, I, I had mentioned that um, this is a very difficult piece. 
Um, it's dense. You know, animals other than man live by appearances and memories. Due to action, experience seems in no respect inferior to art, etc. I'm just, you know, we must inquire of what kind are the causes and the principles, the knowledge of which is wisdom, etc. And this is, so he gets into these causes, and, and if you're not familiar with what, you know, I, I had already talked about with regard to the nature of the causes, that seems pretty strange, right? God is thought to be among the causes of all things and to be a first principle, and such a science either God alone can have, etc., etc. Um, so the original causes of things. This is also where he gives us the history of philosophy up to Aristotle that, as far as, as he's concerned, demonstrates that he's the one now with all the right answers, thanks to all his predecessors. So here we get uh, Thales explaining things. We get um, Diogenes, different Diogenes that we'll talk about, but Anaximenes. Uh, Anaxagoras, etc. So, so the ones that I mentioned, and I didn't mention all of them that Aristotle does, Hesiod, uh, Parmenides. Um, uh, by the way, Parmenides um, was one of the dialogues also with Plato. And in this one, this is a latter dialogue of Plato. And in that dialogue, we end up uh, finding difficulties with Plato's idealism, right? And part of that is, uh, for example, color. If I'm talking about a particular color, and we, we could go to like the color wheel. Let's go here instead of there. Pick your favorite color wheel. By the way, when you study Homer, there's some interesting dilemmas with colors because it doesn't seem like they have very many. They apparently have yellow, they have red, uh, they have white, and they have black. But you get weird things like the wine red sea. You know, and, and what they've come to conclude, by the way, is that um, the Greeks weren't actually referring to color as we, we do. They were instead talking about sparkling or things of that sort uh, when they were looking at that stuff. Paul, you had a question? No, a lot of modern languages don't recognize orange as a distinct color category. There's, okay. there's a, a neat lecture by Lara Brodsky. Um, I think... Uh, might be the previous... You might have seen it on uh, my previous notes. Let me see if I can uh, find it here. So this is Lara. One of these days, they're not going to let me see stuff for free. I'm sure of it. With SAP, your business can be ready for anything that happens next. Be ready. So, I'll be speaking to you using language, because I can. This is one of these magical abilities that we humans have. We can transmit really complicated thoughts to one another. So what I'm doing right now is I'm making sounds with my mouth as I'm exhaling. I'm making tones and hisses and puffs, and those are creating air vibrations in the air. Those air vibrations are traveling to you. They're hitting your eardrums, and then your brain takes those vibrations from your eardrums and transforms them into thoughts. I hope. I hope that's happening. So 
Because of this ability, we humans are able to transmit our ideas across that which is a space and time. We're able to transmit knowledge across uh, across mind. I can put a bizarre new idea in your mind right now. I could say, imagine a jellyfish waltzing in a library while thinking about quantum mechanics. Now, if everything has gone relatively well in your life so far, you probably haven't had that thought before. But now it just made you think it through language. Now, of course, there isn't just one language in the world. There are about 7,000 languages spoken in the world. And all the languages differ from one another in all kinds of ways. Some languages have uh, 